What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we're bringing you Block Digest, episode 221 at block height 631,437 on Saturday, May 23rd. So what's up today, Janine? Hello, hello. I bet we're all stuffed with pizza, aren't we? Pineapple pizza. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was... That was Way too loud and visceral. But they needed. They needed the truth. They needed the truth, Ginny. But yeah, pizza day was fun. But um, before we get into the stories, though, kind of wanted to touch on um some stuff going on on the other side of the world for me. So, o- over the last few days, a communist party representative um illegally set up in the Hong Kong um you know city council building um surrounded himself with security hours before the council was supposed to meet to elect a new chairman um just took the chairman position before anybody else who was a council member was there and then had his security drag out every democratic member of the Hong Kong government, um, lock them out of the council while the vote was taking place, and installed a Beijing puppet as as the the head of the the Hong Kong council. And they are now passing laws, um, pretty pretty much making any kind of, um, you know, free speech like was allowed in Hong Kong prior to this, um, just as illegal as it is in mainland China. so yeah, uh, China pretty much pulled a coup in Hong Kong, and that city is done. Uh, and I think this is this is the last time um, that anybody can look at something China is doing in in the wake of this pandemic and try to rationalize how they are not grabbing every opportunity to seize power every place they've wanted to while all of this was going on. And that's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I couldn't find the mic. But, you know, and most of the world is probably just going to sit around like they always do when there is a legitimate instance of a free people being put under someone else's control and do nothing because there's nothing to economically gain here. Well, there's that saying that we've been repeating that uh, governments never waste a crisis, and they certainly didn't waste this one, especially when they covered it up for so long. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're, they're starting to get very aggressive with Taiwan as well. And uh, I just read this morning, um, you know, they, China's been in, in a kind of skirmish i would say with india over very slight border disputes for a while now and apparently sometime in the last day they have pushed um into indian territory across those disputed borders and are actually setting up you know military checkpoints inside indian territory so yeah um you know this is this is happening and it's it's not you know, ignorant racism to point at what the the Chinese Communist Party is doing right now and say that that's a problem. Like, that this is not one of those times um, where, where you should just point at a, a different government and go, they're doing bad things too, so so what? Um, somebody else doing something that's wrong doesn't make somebody else's wrong act right. 
Yeah, and interestingly enough, the um, uh, the one country that seems to have possibly decided to go in the opposite direction is Germany because they recently announced, or a federal court recently announced, that um, as of December 2021, which, yes, I, I realize that is very far off and not exactly helpful, but as of December 2021, supposedly the foreign intelligence operations, foreign surveillance operations that um, the German intelligence um, commit against people who are not German or outside of Germany will have to follow um, similar or the same uh, standards as they would have to apply if they were targeting German citizens who have full rights, which is a very interesting step to take. Um, who knows if it will actually hold out until the period that it's, or who knows if, if that decision will hold out until it's actually supposed to take effect. Um, but I did find it interesting that um, at least one country in one aspect is not going in that direction that a lot of companies or a lot of countries are going in. I mean, I, I hear something like that and I, I want to remain positive, but I, I just have a feeling that, that that won't actually be respected in all cases like that. But on the other side, that should show something that the government feels the need to, even if it's just lip service, um, offer that to the, the people. But even if they're not actually going to do that, like it's very interesting that they feel the need to convince people that that's how they're going to operate from that point. Mm-hmm. Ah, yeah, but yeah, this, this this is all a bummer. Real world sucks. I want to move into to Bitcoin. Yes, let's talk about other uh, cultural things and myths. Yeah, so um, <laughs> this this is really funny. Uh, I woke up the other day and everybody was screaming about Satoshi moving coins. Um. And an original um, 2009 50 BTC block reward was moved. Um, and some of it was actually supposedly traced to Coinbase. Um, yeah, we have no idea if those are Satoshi's coins. And there is a single piece written by Sergio uh, Lerner from Rootstock that's cited over and over and over and over again. To, to just create the, this myth of, of Satoshi's million coins. And it's all literally just based on assuming that there are patterns with identifiable reasons behind them in the nonce selection for early blocks. And those are all just assumptions. Like it, it's pretty much just looking at which nonces um, were picked in winning blocks and just making a whole string of statistical assumptions um, that this was all one entity because this number was in a block. And that, you know, that, that's nothing you can say with certainty. That's not proof. That's not finding Satoshi with a Bitcoin key in his hand. That's just a guess. And so the, this whole notion of Satoshi's million coins or Satoshi's coins, like it's, it's, it's just a myth. Like there is absolutely no real empirical evidence to assign ownership of any coins to Satoshi except a couple of blocks and a couple of transactions. And only because he actually sent Bitcoin to other people who, who are able to, to vouch for this, to, to fill in all of this other data that isn't present on the blockchain. And so frankly, like unless one of those specific UTXOs that we 100% know were his coins move, we have no idea if those are Satoshi's coins or some random person who flipped a laptop on for a day and turned it back off. Like, you don't know. Like, it's all just guesswork. And it really is time to stop talking about Satoshi in the sense of throwing all of these urban myths around as if they're empirical facts. They're not. And quite frankly, when you start throwing accusations of, of being Satoshi at people, you are quite literally creating risks to their life. 
And so it's just, just in general, I think it's time to stop talking about th this topic, like a, a bunch of kids trading urban myths and, and, and going, but no, my dad said that one was bullshit because like th this, this really does eventually domino into real potential consequences for people when you don't d discuss this topic in a mature way. When you don't actually lay out like this is a guess, this is a myth, this right here is an actual fact we know, and differentiate between those two. And I really think it's time to kind of grow that conversation up a bit. Yeah, and certainly none of this stuff should be used as a basis to harass people for, I don't know, their location or their chat logs or their alibis of where they were at a certain time. Like, that's just disgusting. If you actually feel grateful for what Satoshi, he, she, they did in terms of creating this thing that has influenced all of our lives, I would say in a positive way, then you shouldn't want to paint a target on someone's back, whether you think that's plausible or not. Yeah, like if you if you appreciate Satoshi for Bitcoin, then just leave him the fuck alone. <laughs> it's that simple. Alrighty, so um, guess next one up. Um, I can't think of any other way to to transition into this except um, been waiting for this one. Yeah, this this is going to be a long one because um, I feel like as the days go by, I'm increasingly frustrated by the lack of communication that is happening. And so I'm going to try to communicate as much knowledge um, that we have about this incident as possible, um, including some theories about things that may not have been disclosed. So this will be a long one. But you probably have heard by now that BlockFi reportedly experienced a data breach last week on May 14th. Um, as of the recording of this show, they have still not clearly and explicitly um, disclosed the data breach. They have, in one instance, showed up on a podcast to talk about it, which they have retweeted. Um, but that I feel is a rather indirect way of addressing your customers and not exactly appropriate. Um, so not on social media, not directly on the website in a way that is very obvious. Um, there obviously is a incident report, but the incident report couldn't have been found unless you had contacted one of the customers who had received it in the email. Um, and also um, I haven't checked within the last couple of hours, but no one from BlockFi has been really tweeting about it. The only information we have is from BlockFi users who received an email and linked to the incident report, which is public, publicly accessible, but not something that you could find just by going to their website. And so I saw some customers on Twitter saying that they actually did not receive an email or they received an email much later than other people. Um, the block states that this, uh, in their article, they said this impacted, quote, less than half of the firm's uh, retail clientele and none of their institutional clients. So debatable. Um, there's going to be some contradictions here. But um, just as a quick side note for any BlockFi customers who are EU citizens and or residents, um, under the GDPR, a company that is servicing EU customers is required to notify the supervisory authority um about personal data breaches within 72 hours of noticing the breach and any delay beyond 72 hours needs to be accompanied by reasons for the delay. If the breach is likely to affect the customer's rights and freedoms, you must also inform the individuals who are impacted without undue delay. Um, rights to risks and freedoms means um, if there is varying likelihood and severity uh, that may result from personal data processing, which could lead to physical, material, or non-material damage. Note the keyword, may lead to, not does lead to, may lead to, um, damage, where the processing may give rise to discrimination, identity theft or fraud, financial loss, damage to the reputation, loss of confidentiality of personal data protected by uh, professional secrecy, unauthorized uh, reversal of pseudonymization may be at play or any other significant economic or social disadvantage. Um, now, BlockFi 
in their incident report uh, did attempt to argue that the information that was breached did not represent um, a risk for identity theft or credit fraud risk. Um, that may be true, but that is only one category of risk. So just because BlockFi is also, uh, they're based in New Jersey, that also doesn't mean they aren't beholden to this because if you're from the EU and you're a customer of theirs, it applies because you're an EU person, check Article 33. And um, according to the block, also customers were not notified until Tuesday morning, which would have been May 19th, which even if we are generous and consider May 15th to be the day that they definitely had noticed the breach, that's still more than 72 hours later um, in terms of the notification. So if you believe that you were notified late and or notified improperly, that may be worth looking into. Just saying. Brief break as I scroll. Do, 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 do. Anyway, so the start of the incident report reads as follows. From approximately uh, 7 a.m. UTC to 8.43 UTC on May 14th, 2020, a BlockFi employee's phone number was breached and utilized by an unauthorized third party to access a portion of BlockFi's encrypted back office system. This type of breach is commonly referred to as a SIM port. The unauthorized third party was able to do this by obtaining unauthorized access to the employee's phone and email via a cell phone network vulnerability, which, side note, is a well-known vulnerability that has impacted numerous cryptocurrency users and exchanges for years and should have been uh, prevented accordingly. Um, based on the unauthorized third party's actions, it appears that the perpetrator attempted to make unauthorized withdrawals of client funds using the BlockFi platform, but it was unsuccessful in doing so. However, the unauthorized third party was able to access BlockFi, BlockFi client information typically used by BlockFi for retail marketing purposes through the duration of this incident. Side note for uh, another side note, for some reason, there is a ZDNet article which titled uh, itself BlockFi discloses failed hack attempt after SIM swap incident. Just to be clear, the hack was successful as is clearly stated here. It was the attempt at withdrawing customer funds that was not successful as far as we know. Um, so then they go on in the incident report to list the types of personal data that constitute retail for retail marketing purposes, which is name as listed on the account. So your name, your legal name, supposedly, unless you figured out a way to use a fake one, email address, date of birth, physical address as listed on the account, otherwise known as postal address. Um, usually for accounts of this nature, you can't just give a P.O. box. Um, they try to prevent that. It usually has to be a physical address. So, you know, again, if you manage to fake that, good for you, but uh, probably postal address. And then five, activity history. Now, there has been a lot of debate about what activity history consists of. Um, unfortunately, because BlockFi has not been clear about a lot of these things, we can't confirm at this time, I can't confirm at this time what that consists of, but I've seen a few people say that activity history consists of your account balance and information about pending withdrawals. Um, I, I assume that would include at least the amount that is being withdrawn and possibly the address it's being withdrawn to, but again, don't have details. More broadly, um, maybe activity history, if in the worst case scenario, could, could include other things like prior withdrawals, prior deposits, um, if they are telling the truth and it was only data for retail marketing purposes, um, that kind of visibility into account activity history would, um, it could be limited and that would, that would fit, but considering how terribly they are <laughs> handling communication, um, I wouldn't bet that any amount of money um, I, I wouldn't bet any amount of money on that being the case. Um, and regardless, that would still be sensitive information. Um, continuing on in the incident report, they state, the incident was detected and triggered um, our incident response protocol. The team took the following actions. One, locked the infected employee, employee's credentials, suspended the affected employee's access to all BlockFi systems, triggered additional identity controls for other employees, audited the scope of the attack, prevented a second attempted attack from an author unauthorized third party. Um, and then they also list things that they did in response, including um, apparently doing security updates, 
including to employee mobile phones, um, penetration testing, and updating their incident response uh, protocol. Again, another uh, break as I scroll. Do, 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 do. So now we get into the kind of stupid part. Um, they say, due to the nature of the information that was leaked, we do not believe that there is any immediate risk to BlockFi clients or company funds. Your account funds, passwords, and non-public identification information are secure, and no BlockFi client or company funds were impacted as a result of this incident, end quote. So first of all, um, the response I would have to that is that their assurance that your non-public identification information is safe is kind of worth shit because that speaks a lot to what they consider to be non-public, i.e. Uh, not <laughs> as insensitive identification information. Um, because if you read their terms of service, I mean, I'll get onto that later, but if you read their terms of service, um, they say BlockFi and our third party partners may experience cyber attacks, extreme market conditions, or other operational or technical difficulties, which could result in the immediate halt of deposits and withdrawals, blah, blah, blah. Um, BlockFi is not and will not be responsible or liable for any loss or damage of any sort incurred by you as a result of such cyber attack, operational or technical difficulties, or suspensions of deposits and withdrawals. So them giving you this reassurance, they are doing that from a position where they assume no liability whatsoever, which means they could lie to you and no, no consequence for that. Um, additionally, uh, in their terms of service, your crypto interest account is not a checking or savings account and is not covered by insurance against losses. We will lend, sell, pledge, rehypothecate, assign, invest, use, commingle, or otherwise dispose of funds and cryptocurrency assets to counterparties, and we will use your, our commercial best efforts. Interesting phrase. We will use our commercial best efforts to prevent losses. Yet, any bond or trust account maintained by BlockFi for the benefit of its customers may not be sufficient to cover all losses incurred by customers. Wooey. That sounds like an attractive deal. I'm hooked. Um, in conclusion, their terms of service uh, have clearly removed... I mean, I don't know if it's legal for them to do this, but clearly they want to communicate that they are not liable for any of this. Um, then, back to the incident report, in the what's next section, they write, we recommend that you take the following steps to help secure your personal accounts from this type of vulnerability. Key word, key sentence there. The first thing is that they recommend that you turn on 2FA for both your BlockFi accounts and your personal devices. And then they provide a link to a blog post where they don't mention the data breach at all. It's just a very straightforward guide about how to use 2FA and why it's important. The second thing that they recommend is to turn on whitelisting, which is interesting because for one, whitelisting has privacy consequences. If you are whitelisting certain addresses, you are more likely to use them. And in fact, in one of the, uh, which article was it? I think, I think it actually was the one where they recommended 2FA. There is, um, there is a section where um, they literally say about whitelisting that it allows you to pre-select from frequently used crypto wallet addresses when withdrawing. Again, not recommended to reuse addresses. That is a privacy risk. Whitelisting, basically all it will do is say, okay, can only send to this address. And there is also a delay in terms of the withdrawal actually going out. But the question is, why are they recommending whitelisting when this data breach supposedly did not have an impact on whitelisting. Also, <laughs> customers whitelisting addresses does not mean that an employee with higher access could not, you know, get past those restrictions because they're an employee. They're they're running the service. So I don't see how customers setting whitelisting addresses helps. Also, to a fay. Um, again, the vulnerability in this data breach was on the employee side. It was an employee who had improper security practices, BlockFi as a whole, that had improper security practices for their staff. It was not a customer. So the customer turning on 2FA, yes, it prevents them from getting SIM swapped. 
but if an employee is ever sim swapped again and could still have this problem customers having 2fa turned on would not help um so i don't know how either of these things could affect this issue again break as i have to scroll do, 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 do. Um, so another note, um, this, I don't know why they had a slightly different list, but at the more further down in the incident report document, they actually list a third recommendation, which is, um, quote, frequently update your password. Now, I assume they mean frequently change your password, um, but regardless, frequently changing your password is no longer considered a good is no longer considered good security advice because what that does is it makes most people more likely to forget their password or copy it down improperly when they're changing it and therefore they will lose access to their account um it will that will be more likely than them actually improving the security of their account especially if they're getting tired of constantly changing their password not generating a secure password and falling into the uh dangerous practice of saying like okay my password is password one now it's password one two and then when i change again it'll be password one two three again not not a good practice not a good recommendation um so basically what they've done here is provide a false sense of security to customers questionable advice and unless they're um I mean, I don't see a security person on their team page. I have no idea who does their security, but I would want to have a serious conversation with whoever is giving these recommendations with any kind of authority because questionable. <laughs> um, unless, slight caveat here, unless it is possible that they haven't been fully honest about the extent of the personal information that was that was breached because i have seen a few people say that customer phone numbers were also potentially accessed this is not confirmed at the moment it's just a suspicion from a few people but it would not be surprising that a company which insecurely stored their customers' postal addresses would also store their phone numbers in the same manner. And so if that was the case, it would explain why they would want to recommend enabling 2FA and whitelisting on the customer side, because the attacker could maybe now attempt the same SIM swap attack with the phone numbers that they've gathered. Um, and BlockFi on May 7th announced a new mobile app. So... Understandably, customers may have recently uh, put access credentials for their accounts on their phones. Big problem, if that's the case. Um, worse, if you read their announcement post for the mobile app, one of the features they list is easier login. We'll be introducing facial recognition to the login experience, allowing you to quickly access all the crypto oh services God. you need through a secure biometric scan. <laughs> oh my so, God. Yes. Uh, the reaction time is almost here. But um, so if it was the case that phone numbers were accessed and they were, they have failed to adequately disclose this, I have no words other than that is absolutely shitty. Um, yeah, faces and fingers are not passwords. Faces and fingers are not passwords. Stop, stop, stop. And there. Okay. Then um, last thing on May 1st, or not May, May 21st, I think. Um, they're the one appearance that they have made since this breach and mentioned the data breach was on the layer one crypto podcast where Zach Prince, the founder of BlockFi, briefly talked about the breach for a few minutes. He gave no additional information that has not already been included in the incident report itself or their website. He just said, we're deeply sorry and unhappy with the fact that it happened. The good news is that in terms of the severity of the attacks, which range range from data to massive loss of funds, this was purely on the data loss side of things. I don't know if that's a good scale of severity, but okay. Um, and then he said it did not include the most sensitive information like social security numbers and driver's licenses, which was also said in the incident report. Um, and then finally, he said that they have... Um, dedicated significant resources, direct quote, to communicating with customers who were either affected or not affected. Key note there, because again, we've heard from a number of people who were either not emailed or their delay they had a delay compared to others in terms of being emailed. 
Um, finally, to address the original claim and kind of the frequent claim that I've seen throughout this uh, <laughs> response from them, the, the people who think that a personal data breach of this nature is not a threat, including apparently BlockFi, I would strongly advise that you limit those kinds of comments to your own threat model, because unless you know the threat model of all of the customers you're speaking about, you should not assume that this could not pose a danger to them and their families, because not everyone lives in a safe neighborhood where police respond promptly in the event of a break or a hostage situation, which is entirely possible from having a postal address disclosed and the fact that you own crypto assets. Not everyone has the money to pay for private security or protecting their homes in other ways either. So at this point, we don't know what the motivation of the attacker is and how they intend to use the information that was accessed. And we've been hearing this term a lot about herd immunity in the last couple of months. And guess what? There's also a thing about that when it comes to digital security, because if you're the type of person who is okay with being lax about the security of your information and access to your accounts, you can also become a threat to the people around you and the people you communicate who may have a more sensitive threat model than you do. So keep that in mind. Yeah, and this, um, yeah. I've, in principle, never had any problems with this type of, of service. But I've always thought that the problem was going to come from market blowouts, like we saw in March with a bunch of people getting liquidated. Like I, I kind of assumed that a company like this with this type of service would, would have their shit together security wise. And like, yeah, I was so wrong on that front. I mean, holy shit. Like, you know, I, I've seen comments that they don't even have security people working there. And I have no trouble believing that looking at all the details of this. Like, holy shit. Um, they had like they clearly had no infrastructure already set up to alert customers to this, um, to be able to manage that response in an appropriate way, you know, such as you have had data compromised, you have not in a very quick way. They didn't even have that infrastructure set up, or there would not have been a massive delay in alerting people about this. And then just the conceptual attitude of, of a face as a login mechanism that's insane like there is not a single fucking thing in terms of facial recognition technology i have seen that cannot be fooled by a picture like the only thing maybe would be um the new um feature apple's rolling out um because it actually requires multiple angles and like a 3d view of things but by the same token they're designing that now to work with people who have masks on so look at the addition of the three-dimensional factor and then wind that back because work with masks um like jesus christ you know i i i feel like now the the tempered way and which I have kind of commented on that company and people shilling it, um, I fucked up. I should have been tearing their heads off instead of just looking at my attitude towards this kind of product in abstract and, and just being a little more tempered about it. Because yeah, like th there is no way to undo that. Every single person whose private information was compromised, you are now out there as somebody who owns crypto. Your home address is out there. Anybody can get their hands on that now and they know where you live and they know that you own crypto and people who don't take that fucking seriously, you have no fucking context for where you are. You are a LARPing moron or an idiot who just thinks he's trading a penny stock because if this succeeds, that is a massive fucking danger. If you are here right now and you have Bitcoin right now. Because it doesn't matter how little it is compared to everybody else here. In five or ten years, it'll be a lot. Mm -hmm. You mind if I take a quick uh, gap real quick to get some more coffee? This is going to be a while. Sure. I don't think I can go like an hour with nothing to drink. <laughs>
All right, sorry, I'll be back in like two seconds. Yeah, I mean, I wanted this to be a long one because I'm like, if other people aren't going to do this kind of, if other people aren't going to talk about this in the way that it should be talked about, then I'm going to do it because I'm not going to wait around for other people to do that because some people cannot, cannot afford to wait to hear this like i it is entirely pot i mean i don't think it is because most of the people who listen to the show um they're probably on social media and heard about this but it's entirely possible that there's people out there that have accounts and they haven't been notified and just haven't heard about it yet if they didn't get emailed um think about the yeah so it's it's an open question about who does their security because if you go to their website their team page none of the public profiles that they include are people who do security. They don't use the word security. They're not security experts as far as they present. And I don't recognize any of them as security people, which is fine. Like it's, you know, I, I wouldn't fault a company who says like part of our threat model is maybe to not have our security people publicly identified. There's, you know, there's arguments for that, but you know, in the incident report, they tell you to contact like a communications, they've been telling people to contact a communications email address, which I don't know if that's supposed to represent a department communications in their company. I don't know if that's the right person to be necessarily talking to about this. You would want to contact a security person, ideally. I mean, if this, a lot more companies at least in Europe, they have a dedicated, um, you know, person who is familiar with GDPR and what to do in response to data breaches in regards to those recommendations. I don't think they have one. Um, they haven't said they have one, um, probably because they assume they don't need to. They're in New Jersey. But if you have European customers, might be a good idea. <laughs> don't know. But yeah. Don't know if they have a security team. It is entirely possible. Um, some people suggested that they don't need one because their custody is with Gemini for the actual funds. They use Gemini. Um, Gemini, obviously, as a bigger, larger business, because they're an exchange, would have to have security people to be compliant in any way. Um, but maybe BlockFi got away with not having any because they're not an exchange, they're an interest platform and they're using a custodian third party for the funds. I don't know, but I still think that's not an excuse. If you're collecting sensitive personal information that has to do with people having money and risky assets, you should have a security person regardless. All right, so Janine, I think you just blew away a Block Digest record here. What record? Every once in a while, I just, I get one of those technical stories that I just can't stop talking about, and it ends up literally being like a massive fraction of the show. I think you just blew past that with this Block Fry record by like a margin of two. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, been, that's fine. We've been talking about Black Fi for 30 minutes. <laughs> well, that that's what you get. You know, you don't communicate explicitly to people. Um, there's inconsistent communication. You claim that you dedicated a bunch of resources to communicating and people are still confused. Um, yeah. And then you minimize the impact. That's what you get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess, you know, the last comment I want to make on this one, at least, is, yeah, that that um, rehypothecation in their fucking terms of service you brought up. Oh, yes. See that? On principle, again, I have nothing against that. If you are clear and transparent about that, I actually have a buddy who uses BlockFi specifically in a, in a skeptical way to just kind of feel the thing out. I never knew before you said that, that they actually have that in their terms of service that they are able to rehypothecate. And I, I wouldn't care if they do that, but where, where the hell was the, the big warning about that? Because I never saw it. 
Yeah, so the, this is, I'll give the credit to John Carvalho because he was the one who I I saw it through his tweet when I think I think it was many weeks before this that he pointed it out because he was concerned about the terms of service. Um, because in general, you know, he's like many people, he's seen any kind of like interest earning Bitcoin related stuff to be a bit suspicious. And so he pointed out several concerning things in the terms of service, but it is in there. I don't know how clear they've made that to their customers, but yes, it was in there. Well, I mean, it's just kind of part and parcel. You know, you can get blown out in that type of shit. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a loan platform ultimately, but make those risks clear up front. Like, it's that simple. Like, I have no problem with this type of like custodial legacy shit in this space i wouldn't use it but if you're gonna fucking build that then make the risks clear like bitcoin is set up to fucking let anybody build on it any way they want and that's fine but when you're gonna build on it and you're gonna lie and hide risks and not be upfront about that fuck you yeah, I mean, I didn't want to like the focus for me is not whether their whether their system works, whether they're telling the truth about how you actually make money or such. My concern was about the data breach and the fact that their communication has been misleading in terms of the effect of the the effectiveness of the security recommendations that they make and yeah, that is my main concern. I don't this is not this is not the quality of standard that I want to see from any service, regardless of whether it's centralized or decentralized. Mm -hmm. All righty. Guess it's finally time to move along. So this a little more lighthearted, a little funny. Um, so everybody should know about wrapped BTC, um, the custodial, um, platform that lets you peg Bitcoin into the Ethereum chain by letting, uh, I'm, I'm having a brain fart moment. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. BitGo, um, custody the Bitcoin on the main chain. Um, well, TBTC was an attempt to do that in an air quote, air quote being the key here, decentralized way. Um, by having a centralized entity that you deposit Bitcoin with on the Bitcoin chain and then collateralizing it maker DAO style with ETH on the Ethereum chain so that if the federator on Bitcoin runs away, you get ETH to pay it back. Um, that launched. And then two days later had the pause function in the smart contract executed because of a major flaw that could lose people money, which was... Um, the Solidity smart contract could not parse pay to script hash or pay to public key hash Bitcoin addresses properly. I'll repeat that. The smart contract on Ethereum could not parse the two most widely used Bitcoin address formats. So it couldn't work properly. Yeah. I'm going to leave this silence here in the editing room just for dramatic effect. <laughs> Go ahead. But like that, it, that's like this, this right here is just like, stop, like really just stop. And I, I, I like actually one of the guys who, who was part of this project, uh, Matt Luengo probably just butchered his last name. I actually went on a Monero talk sometime last year. And kind of just had a talk with him about long-term scaling and privacy shit. You know, he's a nice guy. Not a complete retard. But, like, this level of fuck up is just so epic. Oh my god. The whole point of this thing is to interact with the Bitcoin blockchain. It could not parse correctly two of the most commonly used pieces of data on the Bitcoin blockchain. Like, just Jesus Christ. Like, throw Ethereum in the garbage for fuck's sake. Just throw it out. 
it, 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 it has no real use. It is a broken pile of garbage. Just throw it in the garbage. Well, I think next up we have some other garbage to discuss. Nah. Yes, sorry, I had to select my mic. Um, yeah, the other garbage is uh, you have maybe seen the ongoing kerfuffle with the Steemit network and its uh, ever branching community. Um, I'm certain that we talked about uh, Ned Scott, the founder of Steemit Inc., selling out to Justin Sun in February, but I haven't. Well, it, the sale happened in December, but I think the news stories were mostly coming out in February. Um, I haven't been able to find what episode that was in. We did talk about Steemit having sustainability problems way back in December 2018, episode 143 at 42 minutes, 44 seconds in, if you want to see that. But uh, if you didn't see this kind of shit coming from miles away, um, let's get into the latest update. Um, Decrypt Media reported on May 19th that a hard fork of the Steemit network was imminent, uh, scheduled to take place on May 20th which would penalize those who opposed uh, Justin Sun's hostile takeover. Uh, quote, several users of the Steemit blockchain application are going to lose uh, 23.6 million Steam, which is worth $5 million, apparently. Not for long. Um, in March 2020, when Justin Sun officially acquired Steam, a group of dissenters came up with a plan to start a fresh on a new blockchain free of Sun's influence. That blockchain was Hive, and it is now ranked uh, 65th by market cap, which is actually six places ahead of Steam um, as of the article being published. I don't know if maybe that changed, but a former witness in Steam's delegated proof of stake consensus a uh, system who goes by the Marky Mark said that the current Steam witnesses are angry that the recent Hive hard fork excluded them from gaining free tokens. Triple uh, A, so confusing with all these different people, um, which is the name of the current witness group, claims that the accounts uh, that were listed for seizure are those belonging to people who were publicly attacking users, collecting personal information and threatening murder. Um, and they also accused them of spreading fake news and damaging network stability. Um, meanwhile, Justin Sun claims that Steemit Inc. and I are not involved in this hard fork. However, I do have sympathy for team witnesses and can see where they are coming from. The Hive witnesses took their assets away from them by force, causing huge losses to them. And then on May 20th, the day of the fork, it was also reported that Sun had, quote, called the cops on those responsible for splitting newly bought blockchain-based social network. Uh, he called their actions illegal and the work of hackers, and for his latest move, voted to take money out of their wallets, apparently. Um, yeah, so play stupid games, win stupid private prizes. Uh, hopefully this is the end of a very drawn-out stupid game. When I copy a database and change it, you have no legal right to an entry in my database. That's how that works, kids. Yep. Oh, and I was, I was, um, I mean, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was... I was quite surprised to see a Coindesk writer literally in the last couple of days make a comment that Justin Sun and also, I can't remember his name, but the CEO of Binance, that they do a good job um, promoting their projects, like their crypto projects. And I was kind of shocked because this seems like the kind of clusterfuck that is the opposite of good promotion for a project. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and translate that to I get paid money to say nice things about these people. I mean, I have no idea about that. I was just surprised that someone could literally interpret this as being good promotional work. Yeah. Th think we're going to jump, though, um, from silly crypto land into uh, big boy world. So this is a really interesting change. Um, 
of tune. Um, JP Morgan has taken on Coinbase and Gemini as banking customers. Um, so they're, they're going to have zero involvement with the cryptocurrency side of either of those businesses, obviously, um, and just be giving them fiat banking services. But this is very interesting um, given five, six, seven, like, I don't know, pick a random number of years Bitcoin's been around, you want to go back. Um, these types of banks have done nothing but fuck with Bitcoin in every way possible, in every business that fucking is tied to it. I mean, the, the entire situation ultimately that led to the creation of Tether was because of how much banks fucked with any business in this space cut them off from services, refused them to even indirectly use services. Like banks would not even pass a wire along as a correspondent bank in that wire. Um, like these, these, a lot of these companies had to either get special banks that their investors um, had ownership in or, or pretty much just deal without banks or dance around and find a new bank every time yours figured out you were a crypto business. And now JP Morgan and Chase are, are banking Coinbase and Gemini, um, two of the on and off ramps in America that have the most fucking regulator arm just completely up their ass. And I think that should be very telling in terms of how this, this game is going to go over the next five years as far as fiat banking services and how that relates to on and off ramps. I think we are very quickly going to spiral um, down the drain of these types of institutions, um, picking and choosing favorites who are allowed to actually interact with those services. I actually think uh, if you don't got anything to, to say on this, that the next one uh, ties into this uh, somewhat. Yeah, uh, more Coinbase stuff. You may remember that in March, episode 212, we covered the announcement from the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, otherwise known as OCC, um, that Brian P. Brooks, Coinbase's former chief legal officer, would be taking over the role of chief operating officer and first deputy at OCC, effective uh, April 1st. And on May 1st, or sorry, May 21st, in a post by Coin Center, it was noted that Brooks would be taking over leadership of OCC as acting comptroller as of Monday, um, which would be May 25th. He was a speaker at consensus the Consensus Distributed Virtual Conference, and he talked about how, quote, the agency should consider a federal licensing scheme for cryptocurrency firms and, quote, should consider a non-depository payments charter. Of course, Cointer is in favor of this because, um, as they link to uh, in the post, they made prior recommendations in lobbying on the issue in a 2018 report. Um, I believe P it's Peter Valkenberg wrote, an option would be to have the federally created prudential standards administered by a, regu a federal regulator via an alternative federal money transmission license. That is, a business could choose to seek licenses in those states in which it will have customers, or it could alternatively choose to seek a federal license. As a result, the federal licensing program need not preempt the ability of the several states to continue granting licenses. Federal license can simply be an alternative to state licensing, and federally licensed businesses can be absolved under the federal statute of any liability or obligations under state licensing laws, limited preemption. Um, of course, um, you know, whether or not that is a... Uh, a positive or negative for the space in general, um, what would uh, a moment like this, the appointment of uh, someone from the space, be without some financial revolving doors? Um, because yesterday um, I spotlighted the fact that um, Steve Mnuchin, the corrupt banker of 08 Crisis Notoriety, congratulated Brooks on Twitter, as did Brian Armstrong. And so, of course, the revolving door goes round and round. Mm -hmm. 
I think these two things, you know, together paint that very clear picture um, that big moves uh, attempting regulatory capture are coming. Like the Coinbase and everything that they've done in terms of engaging with Washington has just been self-serving bullshit that is pretty much just them and any company like them in terms of crawling up the government's ass, um, trying to make sure that, you know, what, what comes down regulation wise favors them and not so much uh, any, anybody else at a smaller scale or trying to not just crawl up the government's ass and only do what they actually have to. And this, you know, it's, it's a two pronged thing I see coming. The, the banking relationships and the, the regulations. Because, you know, I, I am not very um, bullish on the idea that, that federal regulations, especially crafted by somebody coming from Coinbase, uh, are going to be something positive for this space. Um, I think they will be very negative. Um, like it's just going to be KYC up the ass on everything. Um, and that's your only option to not deal with the maze of state level regulations. And really, if they if they go that far, who knows how much farther they try to push that in terms of what aspects of, of this space that applies to. Yeah. And in a related note, um, it is not only financial regulation and financial companies that um, can go around a revolving door. Journalism can also have uh, such a phenomenon because we recently learned in the last week or so, I'm not sure if this had been reported before, but there was a major investigative piece published about this, that one of the prominent co-authors of the article that was written about the information that Reality Winner disclosed as a whistleblower to The Intercept, um, he has since joined the NYPD. And he has apparently had a 30-year friendship with one of the uh, powerful members of the NYPD. Doesn't that strike you as weird? The doors go round and round. So this is really fun. Um, I am actually excited to talk about how something was broken. Um, so I'm sure by now all of you have heard about the exploit for the Mark II version of the cold card. Uh, before I get into what the actual exploit is, I just kind of want to walk through how the MCU and the secure element on the device interact in kind of a quick high level. So in the normal course of things, um, the MCU pretty much has to go to the secure element and first ask it for the pin counter. Um, for how many attempts at a pin entry have failed um, previously. It then has to prove possession of the pairing secret that's shared between the MCU and the SE, um, demonstrate knowledge of the pin, um, which is actually done by hashing um, a nonce um, with the pin. Um, and this is done with the pairing secret as well to prevent replay attacks between the two chips. Um, and if you successfully demonstrate um, to the SE that you have both the pairing secret and the pin, um, it unlocks the um, memory section um, that holds the pin so that that can be used um, to further access and decrypt the memory section where your actual private keys are stored. So to be clear here, um, in the Mark II, it is actually the MCU um, that is enforcing the rate limiting of failed pin entries. And so pretty much the gist of the exploit here is um, you can actually pull the secure element off and with very specialized equipment that runs $200,000 um, and also requires somebody competent enough to use this correctly, um, you can pretty much grind down um, the layers of the chip um, because there are actually different stacks of memory on top of each other in this. And then um, pretty much um, have two options as far as extracting um, secret information using uh, a literal laser um, <laughs> to do a fault injection in the hardware um, while you are going through the authentication process. And so um, 
pretty much you can either um, disconnect the secure element and effectively brute force the pin, um, air quote, offline, um, because the actual rate limiting of pin entries is done on the MCU, you can just keep trying um, until you find a hash match um, to get the pin from the secure element. And then you can reattach that on the device and gain access to the, the funds, though you never actually gain access to the, the word seed itself. Um, alternatively, um, um, with the, the pin, you can effectively prove to the SE that you have um, the pairing secret and um, the, the pin to pull the, the actual seed out of um, the memory and the secure element. Um, so there, there are kind of two ways that you can really attack this. Um, but ultimately, they require physical access to the device, um, $200,000 worth of equipment, and a high degree of expertise in actually utilizing this. So ultimately, um, you know, this was broken, um, yes, but at a ridiculous high cost that requires a high degree of specialization um, and effectively something that can give you this one shot um, to do so without fucking up the hardware. So ultimately, um, yeah, I would call this a massive win against all the other hardware devices out there. Um, that have been broken by either hundreds of dollars in equipment or with no specialized equipment necessary at all. And so this is just a, a total, um, you know, validation, I think, of, of the physical security model of the cold card. And as well, um, the Mark III, which uses a newer version of the secure element from microchip, is not vulnerable to this type of attack. Um, and also specifically, um, that new SE actually enforces the, uh, the pin timeout in the secure element itself instead of counting on the MCU for that. So yeah, overall, um, I think this has performed the best out of any hardware device that has been broken in this space so far. Yeah, I believe uh, on, they talked about this on the Tales of the Crypt uh, weekly recap, and they said that this was bullish for Cold Card. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, it, it's like, think about it. Like, nothing will ever be perfect in terms of physical security. But this is orders of magnitudes more expensive to compromise than, than every other device that's been compromised out there. Like, that is awesome. Yeah, and in case uh, some people in the chat already brought it up, but in case you didn't see it, there was a rather hilarious conversation between, um, it was actually, initially it was between a Trezor user and um, our favorite um, Harry Wookiee, and <laughs> that conversation ended uh, basically with um, Dan Kaminsky saying that he'd be willing to look at the cold card because um, he, at least from the details that he was being told, he thought that it was um, probably doing a better job of um, anticipating things with like SD cards and stuff than other hardware wallets that he had looked at. Mm -hmm. And for those not familiar uh, with Dan Kaminsky, uh, at least in my opinion, he is one of the most prolific uh, security researchers in that whole space. Alrighty, so got to talk about something awesome. Um, I'm not really quite sure how to frame this, so I'm just going to go into it. Um, so... Trezor and Satoshi Labs have announced a project called Tropic Square. And the, the entire notion is to create a open source um, secure element. And th they put out a long video and blog post with really no concrete details whatsoever. Um, Probably although, because they only just started, be fair. 
No, no. I mean, it's some some of the lack of details is defensible, and some aren't. Um, you know, they, they actually prototyped a treasure using a secure element, um, and you know, there's NDAs that come along with that um, to differing degrees. You know, there are some secure elements out there where literally the entire thing um, is enclosed with a, an NDA. Um, there's some out there where. 90% of the, the chip and its firmware are open and only a small part of it is uh, covered by an NDA. You know, it's kind of a, a specific um, vendor by vendor thing. But th there's a long um, chunk in this post um, where they just talk about how they found all kinds of exploits uh, in secure elements that they looked at. Um, I just say take that with a grain of salt. Um, they also said that the vendor they disclosed them to refused to inform users of those chips for, um, again, take that with a grain of salt. And that one I'll call outright bullshit um, because this uh, recent um, disclosure from Ledger on the ATAC 508 um, that they disclosed that to Microchip, the company who made that in Microchip immediately on their products page um, have labeled that chip do not use in new designs anymore. Um, so the idea um, that there's just this wide refusal to inform customers, um, I call bullshit. Um, and so they pretty but much it use- is, It is Intel. Well, just the point is, like, I, 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 don't, I don't believe that. Um, I think that's marketing. And, you know, they, they get to the point, these are the reasons why they want to build um, an open secure element. And I'm skeptical of this for a few different reasons. Um, one, that is a massive undertaking. And I'll just put this nicely. Um, Trezor has not actually moved forward in terms of hardware designs um, since they first created the Trezor. And they just generally um, are very slow compared to other companies in terms of iterating and improving things. So I am very skeptical that this is actually going to happen because of that. But also, I'm kind of skeptical of the entire um, logic behind this. Because except for um, Ledger, um, the way that every wallet with a secure element in this space uses it that I'm aware of is in a very carefully structured way to provide additive security um, in the sense that breaking the secure element alone um, should not be enough to actually compromise the uh, keys. You actually need to compromise the open chip working in tandem with that. And I'm betting we're going to see um, down the line um, you know, that being nested with multiple secure elements um, from some companies in the space. But the, the point is, is it's additive security through obscurity. Like if you are, if you are counting on secure hardware to add extra security to something, I don't understand the logic in how it being open helps because the minute that something in, in hardware is compromised, you can't fix that. The only way to fix that is to replace the hardware or add a passphrase, as Trezor has responded to every single instance of their device being physically broken. So I'm kind of you know, trying to get through the contradictions here um, in terms of open secure hardware like this. Um, and where this really fits into how open and, and you know, secure closed hardware is being used in this space. Um, how does it help to have a, a secure chip like that open um, when the only solution is to fix the hardware? Now, when something's broken, everybody knows how to break it. And you immediately have to fall back to this is insecure if you don't have a passphrase until you actually replace the hardware. So what's the whole logic and point here? Just use a passphrase. Like this just seems to me like a huge marketing spin because they have consistently for so long refused to use a secure element while every other device in this space has, has found some way to do that safely. Um, and they're just trying to 
to market without seeming to go back and contradict that argument they've made this entire time in the space. And so I'm, I'm really skeptical, one, that they could just pull this off, period. And I'm also kind of skeptical of just the whole logic of, of doing that versus just use a secure element that exists now in a way where that being com or compromised is not enough to get your keys alone. Like I, 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 I the, the logic here, it just kind of escapes me. So, I mean, I'm aware of, you know, the various drama points that occur between the various hardware wallets and sometimes even software wallets. Um, and one of those discussions is about whether or not to use a secure element and the trade-offs of that. And obviously, in case you haven't noticed, Treasure, bleh, Trezor has pretty much always been on the side of they don't want to use it because they want to keep their device as open as possible, whether that's a good trade-off or not that's a choice the customers end up making um whether they're going to succeed at making an open one also something that customers have to decide if they end up releasing a device that uses it but um, i would say in general i think experimentation to make stuff work when it's open source is always a good thing whether the practical result is good enough We'll see, but I, in general, fall on the side of if you can make it open source, you might as well try. I just think what's going to happen if this is even pulled off is they'll sell a device with it. Um, a bunch of people will buy it and then the chip will get broken and it will be right back to, well, use a passphrase. Um, except this time they won't be able to argue that physical security was never part of our threat model. Yeah, I mean, that that may be the case. Um, I would say, like, I mean, I don't know what, I don't know how their competence in terms of doing something like this would compare to Intel, but um, at the end of the day, I don't trust Intel and I try to remove them as much from my devices. So uh, I feel like if, even if they don't have the resources, I would at least give them the benefit of the doubt in terms of goodwill compared to Intel. And Intel is obviously not, uh, not devoid of their own um, issues, especially in terms of things where vulnerabilities are discovered and they're unfixable. I would trust a wallet using that random undocumented Chinese secure element that Cobalt Vault is using in the right way before I would trust a chip that Trezor makes like this. I mean, I like I'm, I'm trying not to just shit all over this, Janine, but like this is a company that took two years to get a wipe pin to delete your key into the wallet. And they're claiming that they're going to design a secure hardware chip from scratch. That's like, really? I mean, you know as well as I that there is far worse out there, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, why don't you tell us about it? I'm just <laughs> no, I'm just gonna take a wait and see approach. No, I mean, tell us, uh, tell us about the the worst things out there. <laughs> oh yes, the worst thing. Um, is that the yes, that is the next story. So, um, I'm sure at least once we've mentioned on the show that you should not, and I say this unequivocally, not use Bobby Lee's ballet. Is it really ballet? ballet wallet is that mm -hmm. how it's called okay as a strange name anyway bobby lee's ballet wallet um just in case you need another reminder someone has actually gone and taken a closer look at one and the picture is just as ugly as we thought if not more um in a medium post from may 22nd so yesterday uh daniel emeli wrote about how he uh, ran into Bobby Lee at the North American Bitcoin conference in January uh, this year. Side note, that is a Scam Central conference, and I would not recommend going. <laughs> but uh, he did, and apparently Bobby Lee asked Daniel to review the ballet wallet, and he did. Um, 
Prepare for this. Uh, so first of all, the metal card comes with a private key that is pre-generated. I think I, I'm. I think we already knew that. Um, there's no way, obviously, to prove that someone else, including the manufacturer, hasn't simply copied and kept all of the private keys that they gave out and is possibly waiting to steal the money later. No way to prove that. Um, or even, you know, let's not assume that they're sinister and that they actually won't do this. Um, it's also plausible that uh, they could have accidentally printed the same private key and or address on more than one card by accident. Again, no way to prove that that didn't happen. Um, so if you get one of these, it's possible that your private key could have been printed on someone else's, and so your money ends up commingled with another person, and then it's a race to get it off first. Um, also, um, obviously it has the fixed deposit address, which, like all paper wallets, would encourage address, address reuse, which is discouraged for privacy reasons. Um, also, for some stupid reason that I cannot even fathom, even though the card itself is metal, the private key um, and or address are attached as a sticker, which would obviously invalidate the use of the metal because der der stickers aren't fireproof. Don't even know if the metal is, but the stickers definitely aren't. <laughs> uh, and finally, in order to actually spend from the metal card, you would obviously have to import the private key into their mobile wallet, which who God knows what kind of security uh, genius made that? Um, I wouldn't want to touch it. And so, Dan, obviously, this is my commentary on top, but uh, Daniel concludes that he would not recommend it for any purpose, including for small amounts. And he makes an argument why. He says it might seem that the card intended for small amounts would not be big enough to target, would not be big enough a target to warrant the attack. Consider though, if 1 million cards are sold and loaded with $50 on average, someone could access the private keys effortlessly in one of the kind of attack scenarios that I already mentioned to steal $50 million after quitting the job at the factory and disappearing. Um, in a traditional heist, the thief steals, then disappears. In this case, the thief disappears first, then commits the theft. The thief could be long gone by the time anyone notices that something is wrong. If Bitcoin were to appreciate tenfold, the total amount in the wallets could rise to $500 million. This is an amount that may draw the interest of more sophisticated criminals. End. Yeah, I mean, this is, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, everybody says not your keys, not your coins. Um, if you didn't generate them, they're not your keys. Like, this is something I've been thinking, um ever since I got this BTCC poker chip. Um, and it's not even thinking that Bobby himself is malicious or anything. It's that this was made in China. And the Chinese government, when they go knock, knock, and they say jump, you say how high. So, you know, ever since these ballets have been uh, <clears throat> being sold, where are they made? Are they made in China too? And that has nothing to do with Bobby being Chinese or Chinese people. It's the government. When they come into a factory, you do what the fuck they tell you because you are in communist China. And that has always been at the back of my mind, a huge risk with these types of things. Because doesn't that seem like the perfect way for a government to get their hands on a lot of Bitcoin? Um, you sell a bunch of these things and you just keep the keys. And whoopsies, all of that money goes somewhere else one day. Mm -hmm. And we, we know that, I mean, well, we don't know, but we've heard from at least one exchange that the, the government has actually attempted to, well, not take keys, but they've requested that an exchange manipulate the prices. So we know that they do that kind of thing. Um, whether they've been successful in any incident, we don't know. But yeah, wouldn't put them pat, wouldn't put it past them now. Mm -hmm. Stickers, then, you know, private keys on stickers on a metal card. Is that really what you want, guys? <laughs> yeah. I only have this chip because I got it as a gift and because it's a, a silly keepsake. 
that that's it. <laughs> I would never in a million years um pay my own money for something like this. But yeah, um you know, next up though, um you can even run into trouble generating your own keys. So, um this is put out by my crypto. Um, you know, Janine's actually covered this quite a few times and some questionable things. Um, one, one of the women involved in that project has done with business partners before. Um, but that aside, um, I, I do believe this is the second time they've actually found a vulnerability in different paper wallet generators. Um, this one, um, bitcoinpaperwallet.com. Um, they've actually found an issue with the entropy source um, where um, as long as you are running this um, not offline, um, it's actually drawing entropy from an image um, delivered to you from the server. So there is a common um, entropy input in everything it generates. And they've actually dug in and found a couple instances going back a year or more. Um, where people just mysteriously have money um, withdrawn from paper wallets they've generated from this. And so it's like, really, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to get into you know, one of the, the stories coming up, uh, a wallet loaded out of a browser that I actually think is going in a good direction that might make that a, a kind of tenable option um, in the future. But all of these these browser based um, paper wallet generators that are years and years old, you should be incredibly careful in using these. If if you do not think that you are capable of digging through the the actual code and how this is generating um, wallets, or do not trust to a very high degree somebody who can, um, you just should not use these. Um, this is incredibly dangerous and there, there are a million simpler ways and, and more solid pieces of software to just generate a key with, and then write that down offline somewhere, if that's what you want to do. Yeah. I mean, paper wallets have not been recommended for a long time, but the, I mean, like in terms of using paper wallets, because like I said, there's address reuse, that's not good for privacy reasons. But then in terms of actually generating the paper wallets, there are so many different ways that could get attacked. And especially when you're dealing with this JavaScript garbage, like, uh, yeah, just not, don't, don't do it. Mm -hmm. And then we actually got a little more, uh, couple more stories in a big chunk all related to wallets um not all so, bad yes so may 21st um blockstream green has finally dropped their desktop version of the wallet um running on mac windows and linux and a nice touch i liked is they have an app image for uh, linux so you don't have to actually scatter binaries through your whole file system to install it um but it supports main chain liquid um testnet their um 2fa setup um tor and um liquid securities um for anybody who isn't aware that's pretty much a platform where uh securities tokens can be issued through multi-sig um where the issuer has one of the keys um so that you can pretty much enforce um the the types of uh, regulatory requirements needed for legitimate securities assets like that um and you can also set up now a two of three um using the desktop wallet instead of a two of two multi-sig so that you can keep um, one of your keys offline and be able to pull out um, regardless of whether you lose the the 2fa or blockstream server disappears um, and currently supports um, trezor um, i think the model t and one and the ledger nano s and x and as well, soon they're going to be implementing a check sequence verify recovery feature um, rather than the end lock time pre-signed transactions. Um, 
rolling out support for more hardware wallet um, as they can. Uh, a single signature wallet option so that you aren't required to use the, the two of two multi-sig with 2FA. Um, that's the default right now. And uh, manual coin selection. Um, and really, like this, I think is this might wind up being um, one of my primary wallets once all these feature sets roll out. Uh, it's a pretty nice uh, balance in terms of uh, multi-sig um, recovery options for different people. Um, you know, once they roll out the single sig, people who don't want that can use it. Um, connectable to your node over Tor, UTXO support. Um, you know, this seems like a pretty uh, solid wallet shaping up, uh, finally. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's definitely um, a need for more streamlined wallets in this space. Yeah, and I was because I was thinking more about this today, and you know, there's this this common thing that a lot of people say where they're like, "Oh, centralized exchange custodial wallets are necessary because a lot of people are too afraid to do self custody, like full self custody." And I really hate that false dichotomy because, like, this would be an example of a middle option where you can choose to do single sig if you want to you just want to have full control or you can do the two of two where you are using their service as well they're getting their signature like that's that's one step towards a middle ground between like you're still controlling your own keys but you have a little bit of help from a service that you know you should obviously decide whether you want to trust or not um because yeah there's going to be a lot of people who won't feel comfortable with full self-custody, but that doesn't mean that we should pretend that there is no other option and keep pushing them into Coinbase 2.0, blah, 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 and their other, you know, big um, security hole partners. Um, so yeah, I like the fact that they're going to offer options. And I, I mean, there's going to be a lot of changes coming to bitcoin in the next couple of years that will you know expand the smart contract stuff multi-sig stuff that becomes you know more flexible in terms of the different schemes you can use and i think people should be more aware of that when they're making statements like you know there's only two options full self-custody or coinbase and it's like nope that's not true that's not helpful mm -hmm. And then um, next up, uh, there has been a major update for the Caravan multi-sig wallet um, that's browser-based, uh, maintained by Unchained Capital. Uh, so this is actually um, really cool. And I'm shocked to say that, you know, even for a browser-based wallet, um, I think that these guys are really moving in the right direction with that. Um, and this is actually what I used to set up uh, my Open Dime multi sig wallet <laughs> when, um, oh my God, I, I hate myself right now. I, I forget his name, but a, a developer in Japan um, made the tool to pull the public key out uh, through the, the signature challenge message. And, um, you know, at the time, it really only supported um, generating keys and making single multi-sig wallets at a time. And this update is kind of pushing it way past that, um, more in the direction of an actual wallet. Um, so the, the first major thing is um, they are supporting um, XPubs now. So rather than being limited to a specific um, address at a time, independent or individually generated, um, you can just make a whole conventional multi-sig wallet HD style. Um, and as well, um, the browser now supports, um, or the, the browser wallet supports dumping a JSON file to save locally um, that would have all of the XPubs, um, the wallet, the, the derivation paths, and everything needed to fully load that wallet again with just that file um, so that users can hold on to that and reload that every time um, they open the wallet again because the the entire thing is designed to be stateless so that the minute you close the the tab the wallet's in all of the information is wiped 
Um, they've also integrated um, UTXO control um, now that they've moved into more of a, a full wallet um, design. And they now have Trezor support um, with the ability to actually confirm the multi-sig addresses on the Trezor screen um, so that you don't have to just trust what's being displayed in your browser. Um, and they've also done a, a real nice uh, UI um, redo. And they also maintained the ability to generate single addresses at a time. They've just moved that off into its own tab in the browser. Um, and kind of the next things um, coming up is there, because Unchained also um, offers uh, loan products and a multi-sig vault. Um, they're going to be transitioning all of the, the private apps um, and services to using the open source libraries being built out for Caravan, um, which I think is a really good thing. Um, they're going to try and take um, what they've laid out in this version um, to move to full PSBT support. So um, things will work with cold card. Um, mm -hmm. And they're really trying to push um, more open source contribution to this. So yeah, I mean, uh, browser wallets is generally a, a very evil thing here um, in this space. I think if they continue moving in a way where keys are not solely managed in the browser and give users a way to get uh, UTXO data privately, um, this could actually wind up being a browser-based wallet that isn't complete dog shit. Yeah, or alternatively, you could use it as an option for another factor for a you know wallet that is more secure. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's it's I I just think it's it's a really interesting looking product. Um, because you know, like I said, like that that just those words browser wallet um, <laughs> have historically been cancer in this space. And I, I just got to admit here that if they keep going in this direction, um, I think that they might actually get to the point of a browser-based wallet um, that could be pretty safe to use. And I, if they get there, um, you know, if they're not there already, arguably, um, I think that's a massive achievement for this space. All right, and then uh, next and last up in the wallet-based chunk of stuff, um this is awesome um so i have been shilling electrum personal server at every opportunity i can get um and there is now a new alternative um hold on one second i am so horrible with names um okay um igdi i think um from the bitcoin embassy in israel has dropped a new tool, um, BWT, that's pretty much um, an Electrum personal server um, alternative. Um, it just indexes the um, UTXOs just for your wallet and can be queried um, through the Electrum RPC protocol. But it also has um, an HTTP uh, REST API um, to give a little more flexibility in how it's pooling data. Um, but generally, the idea is um, you can just set this up and it will query um, every five seconds your node um, for new blocks and transactions. Or you can flip things around with the, the REST API and actually just have the node um, feed data to BWT whenever it gets new blocks or transactions. Um, and I just think this is really cool because... Um, you know, more alternatives to hook your wallet up to your node is not a bad thing. And as much as I love uh, Belcher and all the stuff he has built in this space, um, he is not a big fan of making GUIs. And <laughs> if, if BWT can go that way um, without encountering the same consistent developer problem of hating GUI work, um, I think that could wind up being a pretty awesome thing because I know quite a lot of people in this space who don't use EPS just because uh, normies get massive headaches when you tell them to open a, a terminal. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. So I think that is you 
up next with a let, let, let's call it a dunk let's dunk yeah. on something um speaking of people that got some headaches uh you'll understand what i mean in a moment um in the last episode 220 um about 44 minutes and i talked about the new zcash developer alliance and mentioned some old statistics about how shielded transactions are or were a small percentage of the network traffic in zcash and as it turns out there is a newer paper published on May 18th by authors from Carnegie Mellon University titled Altcoin Traceability, which gives a slightly more up-to-date picture of the success of privacy and anonymity features in both Monero and Zcash, which is the two that they focused on. Um, And the picture for Zcash um, is not pretty. In the last episode, um, that paper that I cited was from 2017, and it stated that only about 3.5% of all Zcash coins are controlled by shielded addresses. And that sounds pretty terrible, but did you know it could be even worse than that? Um, Before I go into how bad it is, I first want to highlight the different types of transactions that they looked at in the study in case any of our punk listeners are not familiar with how Zcash works. Um, would not blame you. The first type of transaction is the rather recognizable unshielded or public transaction, which which looks very similar to a plain input and output link transaction that would, you would see in Bitcoin. You have shielded transactions, which are transactions where the inputs and outputs are not linked. Um, both sides get privacy benefit. And then you have two types of kind of intermediate uh, stage transactions where the, it's either a shielding or deshielding transaction. You are either moving coins that were transparent um, into a shielded state, or you're oppositely moving coins that were shielded into an unshielded state. Um, also important to point out, um, if I read this correctly, they um, in the study they only analyzed up to block. 300,000, which was mined in April 2018. So it's not completely up to date, um, but it is a bit more up to date than the previous study that I cited. And so it's possible that there could have been improvement in the number of shielded transactions and shielded coins since then um, in the latest 500,000 blocks. But given the overall negative trajectory um, between just 2017 and 2018, I kind of doubt it, Um, and also leading up to 2017. uh, The researchers do state that their next goal is to bring their analysis more closely to the latest block height, but they encountered technical difficulties in doing so. Um, If you're interested in that, it did cause them a headache, um, but I won't go into that here. The important point that they made, starting on the bottom of page 7, is, quote, the overall Zcash ecosystem is not conducive towards achieving anonymity for its users. Historically, at any given time, only around 0.09% of Zcash transacted in a 30-day period is shielded. Um... There are five times more transparent transactions than shielded ones, and 13 times more transparent transactions than fully shielded ones. That's the ones where you there is no link between the inputs and outputs. Um, it's not any of the intermediate stage transactions that I mentioned. Most third parties for Zcash actually only allow transparent transactions, given that Bitcoin can easily provide the same support as Zcash transparent transactions. It seems that the large majority of Zcash users not yet understand Zcash's operational model. Um, Despite the demand for private digital money, Zcash is evidently still in the early early stages of development. Furthermore, on page 18, um, because they were able to make some very good educated guesses about who was using the shielded transaction versus not, Um, They say, we observe that the majority of people making deposits into shielded pools are miners and founders, um, largely due to the fact that the founder's reward initially, I think, is transparent, um, but then the payout was constant, so it was very easy to figure out which ones were founder's reward transactions. Um, That was my extra note explain. Uh, Then they say, which follows the assumption that the general user is seldom taking advantage of the ecosystem. Uh, Continued, 
as each user in the shield pool becomes linked to the transparent pool, the overall anonymity of the Zcash ecosystem reduces as the anonymity set shrinks drastically. On top of the already minuscule set of users even utilizing the shielded transactions at all, Zcash is effectively, effectively traceable as of this study. <laughs> so there you have it. That, uh, you know, one of the things that someone um, related to development on Zcash said that I quoted in the last episode claimed that um, the anonymity set of Zcash was a public good and was marketing it as something valuable. And, um, well, I don't know if that's uh, quite viable anymore. Um, so this is something, uh, there's something I also wanted to reiterate, especially because there is some, yes, and the cat would also like to cry about the bad marketing. Um, <laughs> especially because uh, there is some misinformation and misunderstanding still circulating around. Um, there are some talking heads, maybe even twin fucking heads, wink wink, of exchanges that are boasting about adding Zcash to their platform. Almost like it's a flag. Like, hey, we don't actually want to destroy your financial privacy because we added Zcash. Um, but clearly that claim is kind of worthless in practice because uh, when you take into account that they usually explicitly say that they do not even accept deposits from shielded pools and will obviously not do shielded transactions out as withdrawals, um, those kinds of claims are just kind of further perpetuating the ignorance of the users, which is really shitty. <laughs> But Janine, the one person in the crowd, is wearing a mask. He's private. Why are you saying he's not private? Well, at least it's an anonymity set of one. Because that's how anonymity works. <laughs> I'm yeah. a public good. Well, um, now that we're done talking about clowns who don't understand privacy, um, just a, a quick um, assessment here. Um, Nicholas Dorier is actually trying to push for a, a BIP now um, to kind of standardize out the, uh, the PayJoin implementation a little more cleanly because the implementation that BTC Pay did um, was based on BIP79, um, which is actually by um, Javier from Busted Pay. Or yeah, bust to pay. Um, but they tweaked a few things um, from that BIP in terms of their implementation. Um, one of which is using PSBT um, in terms of passing data back and forth. And one of the reasons they did this actually um, was because of uh, an issue with the, the fee rate. Um, so pretty much when the sender goes to initiate the pay join and the receiver adds their input um, without adjusting the, the fee, uh, the receiver doing that, um, that would actually lower the fee rate um, if the fee itself is left the same. And so this kind of creates a, a fingerprint um, in terms of this could possibly be a, a pay join. Um, so you could kind of have this situation now where a wallet would create a round fee. It would go to the receiver who added an input, and then that would take the, the fee rate and make it an unround um, number. And you could actually double check that by just pulling inputs out and seeing if without um, one input, the fee rate is a, a round number. And you could actually use this to fingerprint um, pay joins on chain. And so part of the rationalization for using PSBT was to kind of pass along some of the extra metadata uh, to manage this type of stuff and not require a full node with a mempool. But um, you can go through in the, the show notes and see um, the actual documentation in BTC Pay going through a, a lot of the other specifics and the, the little details here. But this is a fucking awesome thing going forward because, you know, PayJoin isn't just a magic solution. It, it's something that helps a lot. And it's awesome to see really with just 
you know, we're just getting into the beginning of, of adoption of that across uh, different wallets in the space. And we're already seeing people kind of pick in and formalize the specification of what they did and the reasons why, um, you know, before things just start snowballing and actual code winds up everywhere. So that um, is an actual improvement in privacy, Zcash. Take note. Whoop, whoop. All right. And then I think, uh, yep, you're up. Um, with something that makes me want to vomit just looking at the phrasing. Yeah, so for some reason on May 11th, which uh, turned out to be Bitcoin's having day, Cypher Trace founder and CEO uh, Dave slash David Yevans published an article on the Cypher Trace website titled On Cryptocurrency Tracing Companies and Privacy on Blockchain. Um, I came across this post through um, Max Max Tonahill on Twitter. Um, who broke down the post and criticized it from the perspective of a user who cares about privacy. And I recommend you check that out. It will be linked in the description. Um, he also linked to um, other people who responded to um, who responded to his request for you know commenting on what they thought about this. But basically, in summary, David says that Cypher Trace has always been an advocate of user privacy. But, 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 there are laws and regulations, practicalities that mean the consumers, businesses, and government agencies must be able to detect where funds are sent when their origins are criminal or terrorist in nature. Um, and also, he went to cypherpunk meetups in Palo Alto on the first Tuesday of every month back in the late 1990s and early 2000s and attended conferences about early digital currencies. Therefore, what I say is legit, people. And uh, so I thought, okay, legit, bro, um, I'll give you a chance. What have you, since you're paying, you're, you're playing the authority card, what, may, what have you done that makes you worth listening to? And so I was a bit curious about whether he actually made any posts to the Cypherpunk mailing list in 1999 or later or not. Um, didn't find any of those. Part of that is because um, some of the archives you have to like manually parse through it. It's not in an easy, easily readable format online. Um, so I didn't look through all of it, but I didn't see anything at least in 1999, unless he was using a pseudonym, didn't see his name there. Um, and then um, I tried to, you know, find out, you know, did he have a website, Wikipedia page? And oh, yes, he did have a Wikipedia page until yesterday, <laughs> because apparently someone uh, coincidentally, on Bitcoin Pizza Day, um, at Wikipedia, one of the editors, don't know who it is, uh, well, only by the username, but someone decided to delete his Wikipedia page for violating Wikipedia's notability guidelines and or lack of significant coverage. That's gotta hurt. Um, but from there, um, even though the page is deleted, you can look it up in archives, and um, I found some interesting stuff. So a copy of his personal website that was archived in 2009 displays a bio which says David Yevans is the chief executive officer of Iron Key based in uh, Los Altos, California. He is the chairman and founder of the anti-phishing working group um, dedicated to eradicating identity theft and fraud. They have over a thousand membership uh, companies and agencies uh, limited to banks, financial institutions, ISPs, law enforcement, and security technology vendors. Um, before it was acquired in 2001 or 2011, Iron Key was a company that created USB devices and cloud computing security services. And in a March 2008 article from Venture Wire that profiled the company, um, an interesting picture was painted. Um, when it came time for David Yevans, the chief executive of Iron Key Inc., to raise funding to develop his startup's USB flash storage and authentication product, he turned to an unconventional choice in Silicon Valley, Uncle Sam. Yevans received a $1. million grant in 2005 to develop the product through the Homeland Security Advanced Research Projects Agency, a division of the Department of Homeland Security that is tasked with advancing technology designed to protect the U.S., Government funding is especially useful for IT security companies that are looking for inroads to sell their products to government agencies because those agencies are more likely to buy from companies that have already been vetted by another agency, Yevin said. It is no secret that while such government contracts are often difficult to obtain, they can be very large. 
Iron Key now has a number of government clients, which he declined to name, in addition to private sector sales. Um, so that's the end of that. Makes you really interested, doesn't it? Uh, then he was also the senior vice president at Tumbleweed Communications, which, according to a press release from January 2007, um, they claim to produce world-class innovative messaging security solutions for organizations of all sizes, organizations that rely on Tumbleweed solutions to securely manage their internet communications, spanning email management to file transfer, um, has more than 2,300 customers worldwide representing industries such as finance, healthcare, U.S. government, of course, the world's most uh, security conscious organizations rely on tumbleweed technology, including Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and the U.S. Department of Defense. So, yeah. Um, just some additional information. Oops. Hardcore cypherpunk. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, this information is just some background on a person who wanted to play the authority card. And I don't know about you, but um, this seems like a guy whose career is mostly based on privacy being important for banks in the U.S. government, but not necessarily for regular people. So I don't care how many times he went to a cafe on the first Tuesday of the month back in 1999. Uh, your opinion should be uh, validated today based on your arguments today and your actions today, not on what you did 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. All right. I guess. But, not... oh my God, that Oops. has got to hurt. That oh! has got to hurt to have your, uh, your Wikipedia page deleted on Bitcoin Pizza Day as being not relevant enough. <laughs> Well, if you're the type of egomaniac who, you know, derives any kind of value from having a Wikipedia page, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, just real quick, um, it's not strictly Bitcoin related, but it's just a change in dynamic, um, I think, somewhat relevant to certain companies in this space. Um, so the NASDAQ is planning on restricting um foreign ipos and now they're not specifically singling out chinese companies um but it's very clear that this is being done in response to chinese company listening or listings um in the united states um so they're going to be instituting a requirement to raise either a minimum of 25 million in the ipo or at least a quarter of their post listing um, market capitalization. Um, and as well, they're going to be requiring um, auditing firms um, go through the companies and make sure that they comply with global standards. Um, and kind of the rationale for this is that, um, you know, there's been 155 uh, Chinese companies listed on the NASDAQ since 2000, and 40 of them. Um, raised less than 25 million. And this is kind of a thing that, that a lot of smaller Chinese companies do um, to kind of just get dollars, um, which is really hard uh, to do you know, outside of, of China. And so having an IPO for a very small company like that is a way to get dollars, cash out of that company and then a lot of these companies actually, you know, go look and point at a, a public listing in the U.S. Um, and use that to get loans or, or subsidies um, in China. And so it's it's this really, you know, for a lot of smaller companies, it's a way to just get some money out of China and then milk uh, subsidies and loans within China. And you know, in the general global climate, if if the U.S. starts adding all of these restrictions for foreign companies with the, the clear obvious goal um, to restrict specifically Chinese companies, I think that's going to create a lot of barriers for any crypto companies based in China um, trying to you know gather uh, liquidity or backing um, in foreign capital pools. And I think that's going to, you know, we might 
see this kind of ratchet up and artificially strangle um, companies in this space based out of China because you're you're severely restricting you know their options as far as raising capital and so it's it's not you know strictly a story going on in Bitcoin but I I do think that this is going to come around and start having effects in this space in the long term all right we ready for a quick show quick show Yep, so quick it's almost automated. Cash App has automatic stock and Bitcoin purchases now. Kaboom! Um, too, so and I don't you're know. late. The and you're too late. They're out of Bitcoin already. You have to wait for the restock. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why anybody would want to use this to buy equity, but um, it's about time that this fucking pops in for Bitcoin. Um, and you know, yeah. If you are okay with KYC platforms like this and are trying to DCA into Bitcoin, um, seems like a perfect option for me um, as as long as they can figure out where to get more Bitcoin. (laughs) Yeah, and I just want to uh, reiterate because uh, this is also something that was said during the weekly recap um, on Tales of the Crypt where, well, was it? I, I believe they mentioned in that episode that um, if anything similar to the BlockFi situation ever occurred at Cash App, um, I would have the same uh, ferocity of criticism <laughs> as a KYC service, you know, but hasn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's it's all about like the company and the track record. And, you know, so far... Um... I think Cash App is at a pretty solid track record. Like, if you're a legal business, uh, you kind of have to do some things, and that's a uh, that's a choice for the business and the user to make on their own. And if they meet in the middle, they meet in the middle. And unlike BlockFi, which pretends that it's a legal question of whether to, or it's a legal demand that they must uh, block any coin join. Um, transactions that may be linked to deposits uh, have not heard a similar thing yet for Cash App, but who knows? I don't think you will. Although they, because they used to not actually do deposits of Bitcoin, do they have that yet? I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they implemented it uh, a while ago. I think it's like they have a lot of plans to roll stuff out. It's just. Uh... You, know, you kind of got to move slow when you're integrating this into a, a legacy financial app like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. All righty. But I think uh, that takes us into the last story. Uh, we can end on a positive note today. Well, sort of. Um, so I noticed... Hopefully. I noticed on Tuesday that um, Signal, as in Signal Messenger, had published a blog post titled Introducing Signal Pins, which um, still, to this moment, kind of confuses me because I was under the impression that they already had recovery pins since at least 2018 when I tweeted about them. Um, So I'm not sure exactly what part is new. It does sound based on the functionality that I thought the pins had before and the functionality that they're describing now that they have made improvements at least. I don't know how new it is, but that's another matter. Um, Something that caught my eye though in the blog post was the following, quote, pins will also help facilitate new features like addressing that isn't based exclusively on phone numbers since the system address book will no longer be a viable way to maintain your network of contracts or contacts end quote. So um, I don't know if you can read that in any wrong way, but that means that you may eventually be able to use Signal without having a phone. Imagine that. I would be able to uh, communicate in an end-to-end encrypted manner and make voice calls just like I've been doing with Wire for several months now. Um, Anyway, um, as someone pointed out, though, in the replies to my tweet, um, you should kind of be aware that there are architectural uh, considerations uh, still with Signal as there is with any app, Um, but as they described it, uh, Signal has a pinky promise-oriented architecture for protecting metadata and they outsource promise-keeping to Amazon. 
Metadata is literally so valuable in general that after Facebook paid $42 per, per user in the uh, in the WhatsApp acquisition, they shrugged and turned on end-to-end -end encryption for content um, because obviously they don't want, uh, you know, they, they don't really need to look at the content if uh, the metadata is valuable enough for them to glean information from that um, for, you know, purposes. So yeah, I think in general, this is a good thing because I hate the idea that all of the people who use Signal have to not only are forced to obviously share their phone number with Signal in order to use the Signal app, um, questionable how they store the information, but also whenever you want to connect with someone on Signal, you obviously have to give them your phone number and giving out your phone number is a security risk uh, considering obviously the one of the headline stories with BlockFi um, and SIM swaps. So that would be a really good thing if they could get rid of phone numbers. Mm -hmm. That is one of the, the platforms I steer away from specifically because of that requirement, even though I know a lot of people who use it. And if they actually go through with removing the, the necessity for phone numbers, I might actually consider using it. Yeah. And like, again, this is all about different uh, threat models. So if you're a person who still to this day is like texting people over the clear, you know, normal text messages with your phone, you are massively improving your privacy, at least in terms of the content of the message by using something like Signal. Like that's undeniable, but other threat models that have been um, put forth as benefiting from Signal more questionable. But if you're one of those normie people, you should be using something like this regardless of whether they require a phone number or not. Mm -hmm. Something not being perfect is no good reason to not improve where you're at now. Alrighty though. I think that uh, that does it for the day. It's final thoughts time. I need to try and turn my brain on and think of one. Uh, well, my first one is um, obviously, you know, again, <laughs> yesterday was Bitcoin Pizza Day. And obviously some people unearthed a, uh, some previous tweets that um, had screen caps of messages supposedly from Satoshi. And apparently Satoshi in December 2010 said that pineapple and jalapenos was a good pizza topping. All right, so we've definitively proven Satoshi is retarded. Um, yeah, on that note, um, everybody who puts pineapple on pizza, you should be ashamed of yourself. Deeply, deeply ashamed. And if you did that, I don't want you listening to us anymore. See you later, punks. I never want to see you again, pineapple pizza eaters. Bye. Could be worse, could be catch. <laughs>